And all right, so we are recording this. Um, uh, again, thanks for coming today. Uh, logistically, please uh, keep your cameras off and mute yourselves, but unmute yourself whenever you want to ask a question, or you can ask it in the chat, whichever works best for you. Um, I have two computers going, so if I ever look like I'm staring off into the middle distance, uh, it, I'm looking at the other computer. Um, so uh, my name is Josh Muse. I'm the uh, Library Consultant for Library Technology here at the State of uh, State of Vermont Department of Libraries. Uh, but in this context, I'm uh, operating as the what they call the State Data Coordinator, which means I am the one who oversees the um, what we call the annual report, what is nationally known as the Public Library Survey. Um, so that's that's why I'm here, and that's why you all are here today. Uh, I, thanks for coming. So we're just going to talk about uh, changes that are coming to the report this year because of basically because of COVID. Um, and so if you have questions about them at any point, stop me and we can go into more detail. Um, additionally, if you end up with questions about the broader report, I'm also happy to answer those. Um, so we're going to, um, the, I'm gonna show you, so we're gonna use a PowerPoint because the report, the new version of the report is not up and running yet. So I can't give you a live demo on it, but I can tell you what's gonna be in there. So let's start sharing that. Okay, and the parts that we're interested in, I'm going to jump ahead to COVID questions. Okay, so, um, there were, um, um, let's see, best order. Uh, so there were, there were a number of changes this year for COVID, more than we've had uh, any recent year uh, in, in memory. Each year, there's a few questions that get added or removed. Uh, this year, there are a batch of questions that IMLS, Institute of Museum and Library Services, added about COVID. Um, and they're going to end up at the end of the report. They're all um, yes, no questions. Yes, no, not applicable questions. Basically, did you, did you do reference service while you were closed? Did you offer books while you were closed? It's, and they're, they'll take you, I think, probably very little time. So those are, that's what IMLS added um, because they were under, they had a very narrow window to try to figure that out. So their questions are not very detailed. They're just yes, no. We added a number of questions to try to capture more information um, about it. And we'll go through those uh, as we go. Um, they're, they're not questions that IMLS is currently asking. They're, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, IMLS asks variations on them next year. And a lot of other states are asking the same kinds of questions. Um, but we do know, uh, so I'll, I'll get this out there sort of initially. We're, you, we didn't give you a lot of warning on these. So we know that these are numbers you might not have because we're saying, hey, could you, um, we, we needed this number. Could you have started recording it uh, nine months ago? You, and probably you didn't, uh, maybe you didn't. In any case, uh, so you may not have them if you don't have them available, don't worry about it. That's it's. This is a this is definitely a best you can situation. The report is always a give us the best data you have. But this year, because the target's moving so quickly, give us what you have. If you don't have it, don't stress about it. If you have it in a way where you're not totally confident, give us the number you're most confident with. So, so that's the the, the short version is try don't stress about these new questions. Give us the best answers that you have. Um, so. Uh, I'm going to kind of jump through the the changes, what we've added, um, and what what we've got, uh, what you're facing. So let's see. Da, da, da. Oh, okay. Sorry. Nope. Um, another question. For many of you, depending on your fiscal year, you may not be reporting on the COVID period at all. Um, if you use the calendar year, most of you will be reporting on 2019, January through December of 2019. In that case. Obviously, uh, COVID, uh, COVID, you don't overlap the COVID period at all. So most of these questions aren't relevant to you. So in those cases, uh, if, if again, if COVID is not in your period, if you get, and you get to a COVID-related question, what you want to do is enter either NA or negative one. That's basically the system's code for uh, not relevant, um, or, or we don't have it in this case. Um, so if it's a text question, NA. If it's a numeric question, negative one. Uh, there are questions like virtual programming and passive programming that you should you can answer if you happen to have those questions, but don't feel any pressure to do so. Um, so 
if, if you're reporting calendar 2019, you may not have to do very much different. There's just some questions that you'll have to say, not us, not us, not us. Okay, so um, any questions so far? I haven't really gotten into details, but anything that um, that, that you wanna ask uh, Almi, it looks like you might have your hand up. <clears throat> yes, hi, good morning. Um, good morning. So, so for those of us who are gonna be reporting 2019 calendar year, Will we will we want to start collecting information now, even though it's November, for reporting next year when we will be reporting about our COVID services? Or how how is that going to work? Yeah. So if um I would make if you can I would I would try to uh, try to start capturing these numbers whenever you can, and even knowing that they may not be they may be incomplete. Um, but I guess I wouldn't kill yourself about it, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, I, so I would start, um, and but um, I would start, but if mostly if it's not like a uh, yes, oh sorry, um, not if if you know it, we are starting kind of in the middle at this point. But I would do your best to try to capture these numbers for whatever period you can. Well, will when will we see the new questions so that we know what we should start collecting? Um, so, uh, so today, basically, um, I, uh, I'll be, um, I'll send, I'll make sure everything's on the website after this. And so you you can see the new questions and you can see all the information that you, um, will record. It's stuff that we've been, that we mentioned previously, but not in the level of detail that we have at this point. So, okay. So those questions are, are going to be on the questionnaire for, for next year. The yeah, one that so, okay. Yeah, so uh, next year's survey, basically all the COVID questions will just, will sh should basically stay the same for next year. It's possible that IMLS will add additional questions, um, but it will be a little bit peculiar because, you know, it, it will have, our, uh, some of the people will have already answered them. So, but th the questions won't drop off. <laughs> Uh, sorry about that. Um, okay. Yeah. So the COVID questions will still be there next year. Um, so you should keep uh, tracking these um, throughout the rest of, I guess, the rest of the pandemic um, for, for the, as uh, going forward, I would keep tracking these. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks for asking that. Um, okay. So we're going to, um, uh, we're going to jump ahead to more particular, more specific questions. And um, and like I said, all the, 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 the actual nitty gritty, we're going to make available on the website as well. So it, which is just going to basically be a list of the things we're looking for. Um, okay. So COVID changes, um, for this coming year, first off it's, um, uh, is sort of hours and weeks. Um, so IMLS wants us to capture a number of things on this front. Um, first one weeks close to the public. So this is how many weeks was your library closed due to COVID um, where people couldn't enter the building? That's the, and, and vestibules don't really count. So if you're doing a vestibule pickup, that is not entering, it should not be entering the building. It's basically coming into physically in the building to engage in library activities. Curbside doesn't count. So we wanna know weeks that no member of the public was allowed in your building. Um, so that should just be a flat number. Then we're looking for total hours for the reporting period that fall into these uh, categories. Uh, the categories are open normally, open by appointment, and open for curbside. The thing is, we won't if you're if you have more than one of those going at the same time, like you're open by appointment, but you're also doing curbside. We're only interested in the most open level that you have, if that makes sense. Um, so if you're doing if you're for example, like I said, open normally and offering curbside, those hours are open normally. Um, we don't want duplication, basically. We don't want you to say, I was open for this kind and this kind for these hours. So uh, it's an um, unduplicated number of the hours that you were open the year. And for periods that you were before COVID, uh, when you were open, just open normally before any of this happened, those all just go in the normal, normally open numbers. So it's a total for your entire year but is trying to capture what we're trying to get at is hours that you were not open 
um, because of COVID or that you were open by appointment or open for curbside. Um, that's, I know that's a little confusing, but that is seemed to be the, the, the best way to track this. Uh, yes, Jan has a question. Hi, just for open normally, um, if we're, we're open, but we have reduced hours, we're calling that open normally? Yes, sorry. Um, yeah, and that's, uh, that's confusing because we have, we ask uh, different questions about reduced hours in, in other places. Um, yeah, so basically we want, if people can come into your building without an appointment and engage in library activities, you're open normally. Uh, we, um, we just wanna know how many hours you were open in that way. If you're open by appointment, and I, I should have said this earlier, if you're open by appointment, it's how many, um, uh, your window of being open. So if you're open for appointment for eight hours, but there were randomly, there were only people there for two hours, it's eight hours. It's the entire window of potential appointments. I think I have, oh, I'm sorry, I think I have one other person who is, has their hand up. Brenda, Brenda, you have your hand up as well. Can you, um, would you like to ask a question? Or maybe you, I'm going to lower your hand because I think it might have been from earlier. Um, okay. Yeah, so uh, so first part uh, is um, is weeks and hours. Um, at any point, if you when you get to this point, if you say, I don't, this made sense at the moment and now it doesn't make sense, uh, just ask me and we will figure out what's what's up with it. I know that these questions are all a little bit weird. Um, and, and new. They're all new and they're structured in some cases in new ways. So, okay, so that's hours and weeks. Uh, again, if you, uh, if COVID doesn't cover your period, you're not gonna put anything for these. Uh, okay, so we're gonna hop to the next one. Um, any other questions about hours and weeks? We're open for curbside for eight hours, but open for appointments for five hours. Okay, that's a great question. Thank you for having an actual tangible example, Deb. So, um, okay, so for example, uh, Deb's question is for anybody who's on the phone, if we're open for curbside for eight hours, but open for appointments for five hours in the same day, how do we count that? So what we want, would want you to do in that case is um, you're open for appointments, and I'm gonna assume that that means they're overlapping. Um, so you would say for five hours, we are open for appointments. That is how, that is the most open part of this. Um, and then for three hours, we are not open for appointments, but we are open for curbside. So I would want, we would want five hours of appointment hours and three hours of curbside hours. If that makes sense. Does that kind of capture it? If, if they were for some reason not overlapping, if you did, um, eight hours of curbside and then five hours, or I mean, uh, yeah, eight hours of curbside and then five hours of appointments entirely separately, you would count both of them. But basically we just wanna make sure that we're not, um, hours are not going into um, more than one category. Any, let's see. Uh, yes, okay, so Cindy's question is, these, uh, these entities do not include phone and email reference time close to the public, but answering the phone, et cetera. Yes, yeah, so unfortunately, or, or com complicatingly, that's true. Um, the IMLS, and for this context, we're open. We're we're interested in tracking direct interactions with um, with patrons, direct physical interactions with patrons. I guess um, there is a question. There are, uh, is a question on the yes no section that captures time that you spent. Um, uh, or not, sorry, not, not time that you spent, but whether you were um, offering reference services or the like while you were closed, but that's a yes, no. Um, those uh, things like that should show up on reference questions. Um, so, and so I guess I'll, I'll talk about that right now, but, um, but otherwise is not included in your, the hours that we're looking at. And I know that feels like you're losing a lot of hours that you accomplished a lot of good work, um, but that's, uh, that's the way that it's uh, structured. Um, so reference, I just want to talk about reference because we're it's not it hasn't changed at all. But if you answer a reference reference question, it doesn't um, whether you're open or not, no matter the context. However, if it's by email, if it's by phone, if it's by shouted through your window, it's still a reference question. So um, when possible, track those the same you would any other reference question. Um,
Oh, um, let's see. Okay, so Catherine's question is, given this, then let's change the language of the question since it can be misinterpreted. Let's call it building, not library. Could you elaborate on that? I'm not sure I follow. Um, Okay, I'm going to jump to Brenda's question, uh, and then I'll come back to that one. So Brenda asks, does printing, faxing, and photocopying service while curbside count as curbside? Um, uh, for this con uh, in this context, we're not um, we're not in, uh, we're not counting uh, printing, faxing, and photocopying services. Uh, we're not tracking that. So if you are offering curbside circulation, then that's the important thing. If that's happening, then that counts. And if it doesn't, um, yes. So, it, it, so it, we're, we're not trying that, but if you're doing that, we're only interested in whether books uh, and other items are going out, so. Oh, I, okay, I gotcha. So I, I'm, I, um, I'm making it sound like the library is closed when you were open, when you were, when you were offering services. Um, okay, that's a good point. Let me write that down and make sure that we at least, um, library is open, building is closed is basically. Um, and make sure we're not saying anything confusing there and that we are kind of capturing it. Thank you. Thanks. That's a great point. Um, and I think that, that a lot, yeah, a lot of you have probably had to make that, that jump for your patrons. So I think we can, we can, uh, follow along with that as well. Let me, let me just make sure, uh, I need to jump out and make sure I don't have anybody who is waiting in our lobby. No, we don't. Okay. So back here. Okay. So that was um, hours and um, weeks. Um, yeah, and so um, just to reiterate on the, the printing, photocopying, scanning, et cetera, uh, we, uh, we greatly appreciate that. And that gets that shows up in our, um, our status uh, survey that we're doing. But for this one, um, it's, uh, we're, we're more interested in, in the circulation aspects. Um, OK, so. Uh, COVID changes in 2020 curbside. Okay, so this is a number you may not have, but if you do have it, um, we, were, we would like to capture a number of users who uh, stop by to do curbside or other non-standard circulation method. If they're picking up in the vestibule, if you're delivering something like that, if you're doing something that you probably weren't doing before, um, we wanna track the number of users and the number of circulations, if possible, if you have these numbers, if you don't, don't worry about it. Um, those circulations also count um, in your, um, uh, the, so the circs also count in your normal circ. So you don't have to like pull them apart and separate them. Just, this is basically just us trying to figure out how much curbside people did. Um, so if you have it and if it's, if you can break it out, great. If you can't break it out, don't stress about it. Um, but again, these numbers, those circulations for curbside, which are probably just in, in, lumped in in your ILS, still count under your overall circulation numbers. We don't, um, but but also separately, if you're able to tell us how much curbside you did, in this case, that's great. You just want to sort of capture that because it's an important thing people are doing. Questions about that? Basically, I think it's you'll either have it or you won't have it probably. And if you can start tracking it going forward, that would be great. Um, Oh, gotcha. Okay. Uh, Bree, Bree's question is, many families ordered one order um, while they had come in. It might have been multiple people, kids and adults. So that's the thing that is probably going to happen in a number of the questions we have where you're going to, uh, for this one, um, I think um, probably you're just going to want to do if you have to sort of make up a number, then we, <laughs> then that's not where we're, we're, we're comfortable. So I would put in by family. If you feel like you, I would just put one in for family if you don't have more information <clears throat> is, is my answer. And I know that's going to undercount, but um, I think coming up with an average, uh, like an estimate and saying that, oh, it's always two people or something is, uh, is a little bit fuzzy. Um, is probably not something that I would do. I think in this case, I would be inclined to, if if there was one order, 
come in with fam one family and know that the, the number is that you're not getting everybody. Um, but the, you hopefully will still get your CIRCs would still be as high. Um, so Erica asks, you're looking for both number of people and number of items picked up. Ideally, yes, that's what we would like if we can, if you have it, um, is the number of people who stop by and the number of circulations. You may not have one or either of those. Um, and if you don't, that's fine. It's just um, we're trying to capture the curbside service to the best of our ability. And I think both of those numbers are important um, if available. Uh, any other questions on our on the curbside questions? All right, I'm going to hop ahead to the next one. Oh, uh, so uh, so I'll me ask. I hope IMLS knows that curbside numbers will be very underreported. I bet you're right. Um, so. Uh, full disclosure, the curbside numbers are for us and are not for IMLS. They didn't ask. We know that it's not going to get at everything, but to some degree, it's, it's, it was a thing that we, we want to be able to point to after this all, you know, when, when people say, so what did libraries do during COVID? And we know that it's not going to be everything, but we wanted to try to um, uh, the, the, the more that we can show, the, I think the better off that we will all collectively be, be knowing that it's not everything. Um, Bree asks, is there a report that vocal folks can make to help capture this data for everyone? So I think so. Um, so mm, uh, I, don't, I don't know that the vocal stuff will necessarily help with the curbside unless it was handled in kind of a different way in, um, in Koha. Um, that's a good question though. Let me write it down, but I don't have a good sense for this. There is a, or was a standard vocal report that was kind of the annual report report that had most of the questions that you were going to get. I don't know if that is still up and running, um, but, uh, I don't know if it would, um, if the, uh, it would be able to help with these ones. But that's a good, that's a great question. Um, okay, I'm gonna hop to the next one unless anybody else has any other questions. Oh, um, yeah, no, and I'll say this again when we get there. Okay, programming. Programming's the biggest one, um, is the, the biggest changes. And so these changes are likely to stick going forward. Um, basically, we have broken programming into um, uh, three categories. Uh, it's going to be in-person programming, which is basically what programming what we, what is physically in-person. Um, and uh, what we mostly thought of as programming uh, before COVID happened. Uh, and so that is what we were have been tracking previously, and we're going to keep tracking it in the same way that we have been. Um, the uh, let's see. The um, second kind is virtual, which is programming that you are doing live with people online, where they can interact with you in some fashion, where they can put comments, they or 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 actually talk or whatever, but as long as there is a back and forth, it's, it counts as virtual programming. If it's, if it's totally one way, if they can look at you and can't do anything, which I think if you're on Facebook or you're on YouTube or whatever, they can at least put comments, that counts as virtual. If for some reason you had a program where it was really, really just one way, then that would probably go in another category, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, but that's the, uh, that's the split. Uh, so in-person, virtual, and then the third kind, which we will talk about um, in a second is recorded. Recorded is either things that you totally pre-recorded and then just say, all right, at nine o'clock, we're going to show this or, or sometime like that. We're going to have an event that is entirely, um, this a canned event that we already recorded that is nobody, there's no interaction. Um, so that's one thing that recorded can be. And then additionally recorded is anything that you had that was virtual that you just sat on YouTube uh, from then on that people could look at not live. Um, and the reason for that split is that 
IMLS's definition of programming requires it to be kind of um, interactive and there to be a staff member doing it at the time, it's simultaneous, interactive, simultaneous. So in-person and virtual go both end up in IMLS's pot of programming and then recorded ends up in this other thing that we're keeping track of because we think it's important, but that IMLS is not asking about, at least not asking about this year. Margaret has a question. Um, please ask, Margaret. Um, I'm just wondering, what about a program that you did live, but you also recorded? So it could be made available to people who were unable to be yep. there for the live version. Absolutely. Okay. So we sort of like I kind of I I think the standard process is going to be that you. Um, you, like you have a live story time, you do it on Facebook Live or YouTube or whatever, and that that counts as um, a live, uh, a virtual program. Boom. So it's one virtual program, and then the live attendance um, is um, it counts as virtual attendance. Everybody who was there while you were doing it, and then you leave it on Facebook or YouTube, whichever it is, and people, like you said, people who were not there can watch it whenever they want. That makes that counts as recorded, um, and so for recorded, and we'll talk about what the recorded numbers look like. But we want to, um, we want there. You, you're trying to capture an event and how many views the event has. Mm -hmm. So for virt virtual and recorded, one event, one event could be both. Is, um, okay. is the That's thing. what I was looking for. All right. Um, thank you. Thanks for asking that. Um, okay. uh, all right. So we have a few. Um, Let's see. Uh, Amy says, so a podcast or solely recorded story time, no virtual attendance counts as, uh, so we, we would count that as recorded, um, as a recorded type of programming. Um, anything that that is, yes, anything like that, that is totally recorded ahead of time um, that you then make available, I would count as recorded programming and then and put it under that camp. Again, recorded programming, for what it's worth, is something that we're capturing, not IMLS. IMLS hasn't, yes, uh, it, so it doesn't need to have been virtual first. Got it. So yeah, if you do it, if there's if an event is never live, like basically, we'll say a podcast is a great example. You make a podcast, you recorded it in the uh, studio or in, you know in your library, you upload it, boom, people can download it whenever they want. That is a recorded event. There was never a way to watch it live. Um, so either way, that would go under recorded. Um, yeah. Uh, Bridget asks, we have Lego Club pre-recorded. There's a challenge and example. We uh, we encourage kids to post photos of their creations. So it is interactive and pre-recorded. Um, so in this case, unfortunately, so this one is an IMLS definition and not an US definition. So I don't have wiggle room. So I think uh, the IMLS definition base does require um, sort of simultaneous staff availability, I guess, uh, for an event to be live, which in this case, is so virtual. So um, so that does count as, I, I, I like that. I think that sounds like a great program and, and you're getting many of the things that you would get live, but for the, we have to follow the IMLS definition on this one. So that would go under recorded. Uh, but thank you for asking. And again, I think that's a great program and that it's a great way to make a program more interactive than it would be otherwise. Um, let's see. Um, I'm just going to jump back because uh, Almi had a point about um, circulation, um, which I'll just go back to. Almi said, during times we were doing only curbside, we can get circ, st uh, circ stats for that period time period. It's the parts where you're doing both that it would be very difficult to get them apart. Um, yeah, but we totally, yeah, that makes total sense. And so that's, that's a good point. So you might be able to get circ numbers when you're just doing curbside, but then when you're doing both or when you're alternating, when there's periods, it, it may be very difficult to get those numbers. We totally understand. Don't um, like we don't want you totally in the weeds on any of these COVID numbers. Like, so don't if, you, if you're like, well, all I have to do is go through the spreadsheet for 365 days and I can pull out this number. I don't think you should do that. Um, you you should do your, your best. But I know how busy I mean, actually, no, I'm lying. I can imagine how busy you are right now. I'm sure I don't have the first clue how busy you actually are right now, but I don't want to like take up weeks of your time pulling out little details. So do your best, but don't kill yourself um, on this. Okay, so 
uh, Jan asked a question, and um, let me, um, Jan, I'm going to get back to yours in a second because I think the next one will, the next slide is going to explain a little bit, a bit, a little bit better. Uh, Jan asks about um, Facebook Live events and events that are virtual to start with, and uh, then end up recorded. But we'll, we'll co I'll, I'll cover that in the next one. So for this one, we're, I, I would just want to reiterate: um, in person, virtual, and then recorded. We'll talk about recorded in a second. All the events, like programming has been previously, um, uh, we want ideally you say what age group they're focused on: adult, children, or young adult. Um, uh, and it's the group that they're most focused on is adult, children, or young adult. But if you can't break it down, you can put it in an un just total, you can give us a total. And so virtual events should go in those same categories that the uh, in-person events always did. Um, so that's thing one. Attendance is likewise broken down by, if possible, the focus of the program, not the age of the attendee. So if you have however many people went to an adult program, no matter their age, they go under adult. No matter how many pe uh, people who attend a children's program, no matter their age, end up under children, and the same with young adult. And then if you're not able to break it uh, down that way, you can also just give us a total. But just want to reiter uh, repeat that there. Like if you have, if a kid is attending an adult program, that's an adult program attendee. So you don't need to know how old the people are, you just need to know the focus of the program. If you have an all ages program or a family program, there's not an answer for that. So I think, so in general, put it at the, the thing that it's closest to. If you think it's, um, which, uh, you know, so if it's kind of, it's a kid's event that adults are welcome at, I think it's a kid's event. We can always talk about that if you have questions. But um, in general, put it under the thing that you think uh, it's the most appropriate. Um, all right, so I'm going to jump to the next one because that's recorded events. And we'll talk about that kind of all of one piece, and then we can ask questions. Um, OK, just to reiterate, recorded programming counts programs that were pre-recorded or programs that were live, but that are now recorded um, for people to view whenever they want uh, without any time schedule. Um, so again, if you have a live virtual program and then the recording is available after, it's counted twice. It's counted once under virtual and once under recorded. Um, and um, yes, so that's, so that's that. Uh, we want you to count views for recorded programs. Um, okay, so actually, so we're actually reporting FB Live programs twice, is that right? So you want to count the program twice, but the virtual programming and the recorded programming, so the live and the non-live views are separate. Um, so in Facebook Live and YouTube Live and the like and, and, and that sort of thing, there should be a count for how many people were watching it when it was happening. Uh, live views, I think is what it's typically called. So that's those go under virtual. But then if somebody watches it a day later, an hour later, a day later, a month later, we want that under um, the recorded views, ideally. Uh, so for Facebook Live, what we're looking for are one minute views. Uh, that's somebody actually is watching it and not looked at it for three seconds on their phone and then turned it off. Um, for everything else, unique views is the metric uh, that, that we're familiar with. There may be other products out there that have a different thing that they call it. Um, Yes, let me, uh, okay, so Eric's question is, can you at some future point do a screenshot where to find those views by um, and for those minute views? Yes, so absolutely. Let me, um, do, 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 where to find live views and recorded views on popular products. Um, can totally do that. Um, yes, so it's, um, and unfortunately, like everything else, every product, uh, Facebook, YouTube, Zoom, et cetera, tracks it in a slightly different, I mean, not in a different way, but they use different words to describe it. So, um, and then uh, last but not least on recorded programming, recorded programming categories, we're not breaking it down by, by age, it's just the total. So it's just how many recorded programmings and then how many uh, views of those recorded programmings. Uh, Let's see, Bree, you have a question. Yes, I do. Um, several libraries, including our library, used um, short videos by magician Ed Popolarczyk. Um, He was kind enough to send those to us. So we did not 
necessarily create the program, but we kind of disseminated it to our audience. Mm -hmm. So does that count as, and they were recorded, so obviously it's a recorded program, um, but that still counts as recorded programming. We can count those views from our Facebook page. Um, is that, is that yeah. kosher? Yeah, I think, I mean, it's sort of, it's similar to if somebody had come to your library and put on a program that right. they would, it still counts. If you were, if you were, uh, if you were involved in it in some fashion or, or mm -hmm. feel like you were offering it, that counts as your program. Um, I think if you were sort of flippantly sharing a link uh, or a series of links or something right. that might not uh, count, but if you, if but you were if involved. But we had it as Magic Monday, like every Monday it was released and people enjoyed it. Um, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Okay. I, I think Thank if you. you if you made to some degree if you made an effort on it if you were you were involved <laughs> in it in some fashion I think it counts as your program in this context. Uh, so. Okay. Thanks, Josh. Thank you, um, Margaret. You have your hand up. I just want to see if you had a question or if that was from a previous question. Previous question. Sorry. Oh no, it's all right. The, the hand oh, thing is a little bit weird. Lowers my hand. So. Thank, thank you. No, it's not intuitive, and we've I've had meetings where I had my hand up for uh, 45 minutes. So, um, okay, let me hop back to chat. Um, okay, so other, do we have other questions about recordings? I know, and I and I apologize. I know that the the virtual and recording piece is kind of complicated and fiddly, and it's. Um, this is the best system we were able to come up with. Um, the parts that we have control over, it was the best system we were able to come up with. So, um, and I'm here to help when you go further and have, you know, or get to try to do the numbers and you're like, wait, this doesn't make sense. So we'll figure it out. And also I will uh, try to answer, we'll, we'll get Erica's request to try to tell you exactly where to find the numbers in, in the po most popular products. So hopefully you'll just be able to look right there. Um, Okay, so I'm gonna move to the next slide. Um, okay, so uh, we have additionally, um, this is the thing we've been talking, we and other state libraries have talked about for years, is uh, what is probably going to be called passive programming, but uh, as soon as I get the chance, it's going to be changed to self-directed programming because I think that's um, a, a better name. <laughs> frankly, um, but uh, but I didn't, I'm stealing it from a different state that, that, that used that and everybody said, oh my God, that's so much better than passive because it gets at it better. Um, okay, so in short, because I know there's a lot of, there's even more of this going on than is normally going on um, in uh, libraries. This is another thing that we thought was important to try to capture. There, as, you know, we wanna, we wanna get at, we know libraries aren't doing, um, are doing different things and we can't get all of it, but there's things that we would like to be able to get at. So there's a passive programming question, which has three parts. Um, it is, the first part is the number of different programs you offer. And what I'm, what we, we are thinking of, a, a passive program is anything that you are offering to patrons that they, I'll give you examples. Um, so, I mean, you know what the examples are, but I'm just gonna repeat them. Uh, take home, like a little take home craft or a take home, anything like a take home thing is it counts. A story walk counts. Um, anything that you're putting together that they're doing away from you, um, uh, or, or the story walk's not away from you, but the, you know, not interacting with you. It's not a program because there's no, there's no interaction. You're not running anything simultaneously, but there's something that you constructed that you were giving patrons to do at their leisure by and large, um, or or in the building, technically, though I don't know, there's probably a lot of that going on. But um, so each one is a different program. If you have a craft bag and or something like that, a do, take home craft or take home games or something, and then next week you change all the content inside it, it's a new program. Um, if you basically, if, if, if you keep doing an ongoing thing, but you change it, every time that you change it significantly, it's a new program. So if you have a story walk and then you offer another story walk and then you offer another story walk, each of those are a new program. Again, these are numbers that may or may not be available, I know, uh, retroactively, but whatever you have, we're, we're happy to get. Um, okay, so there's, it's gonna ask um, the program, and then um, we are asking for an estimated number of participants. For things that get taken home, you might have a fairly good number. This is how many went home. For things like a story walk, you're, 
going to come up with a really, really rough estimate, I think, is, um, or, or, or don't, if that, that's totally your choice. Um, but that's where we know that this is the most ballparky of ballpark questions. Um, but we just kind of want to get an idea. Um, and, they're, uh, and they're not broken down by age at all. It's just how many, pro, um, how many of these passive act, uh, self-directed activities did we do? And how many people do we ballpark think might have been involved with them? Uh, Margaret, you have your hand up. I really do have a question this time. Absolutely. Um, so we did some story walks. We did a couple of them um, at the Park and Wildlife Refuge here in Charlotte, and they were very popular and people loved them. We did have a QR code at the on the last um, sort of panel inviting people to make a comment or let us know they had been there, but we know that not everybody used that QR code. So can we somehow combine the QR code numbers with uh, some estimate? Yeah, absolutely. This is, I'm not, um, I'm, unless, unless you come back and you say, I think 75,000 people did our story walk. Um, the, your, your, your estimates or, or whatever they are, I, I trust your judgment and use those. If you want, okay, so this is a point um, that I, I could have made earlier. If there are stats that you have, like the QR code one, that we're not exactly asking for, or that we're not directly asking for, one option is to put it in um, the narrative section at the end of the annual report. The, okay. the, what do we accomplish? If there's any stats that you have that don't fit into a category, but you think are cool, feel free to throw them in there. But also feel free to use your the QR code. What If you have a tangible stat, but you know that it was only you know, 10% of the people there right. think. Feel free to use that as a jumping off point to come up okay. with what you feel like is a good yeah. estimate. And, and again, in, in general, it's an estimate that you have, that you feel good about. That's where we're, that's sure. what we want. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thanks for asking that. Um, all right, so other questions about self-directed activities. In general, probably the answer is going to be, if you think it might be a self-directed activity, it probably is. Um, it's a fairly broad category. So if you put uh, the idea is if you, if you put a fair amount of work into it and then patrons did something with it, it's probably a self-directed activity um, that is uh, it doesn't count like traditional programming. So it doesn't it doesn't usurp that if you're doing traditional programming where there's a you know at the same time that things are happening. But this is for the other stuff, the stuff that people go into on their own. It's kind of the physical equivalent of the recorded um, category. Uh, oh, okay, so Amy asked a question. What about something like a jigsaw puzzle exchange? Is that going too far afield? I don't think it is. I think, um, so, okay, so full disclosure, the self-directed programming question is one of our questions, is not an IMLS question, and that's why I have a little more flexibility over the definition. So um, I think that to some degree, if it's something that you it took some work to put together and patrons are doing, I think a I think a jigsaw puzzle exchange would, would could would, would would totally because uh, you had to organize that. Frankly, um, it's uh, and I think so. I think that would work if there's something else like that that you made happen that involved patrons. Then I'm uh, I'm comfortable with you including that under both under uh, self-directed. Um, let's see. Uh, Margaret, do you have a, another question? Nope, I just forgot to put my hand in. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm going to keep. Um, Jan, do you have a question? Okay, I'm going to. Um, Jan, I'm not hearing you if you are uh, talking. I can't unmute you, but you feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question if you'd like. I'm sorry, I, somehow I thought it was unmuted. So I- I've done that all the time, so. <laughs> um, so my question is, I have several different programs that fall under this category, and I have good numbers for, for like the craft bags, but no numbers for the story walk. So is it better to just leave that blank, or is there a way to- uh, what I would do, um, so my my uh, my thought is, it's whatever you're com most comfortable with. Um, so I'm uh, I'm giving. So you definitely have the option of making a 
wild estimate on the story walk and including that. Um, if you would rather not, you can totally use the grounded numbers and then in in the narrative say, we don't have numbers for story walk, but this is if we had to guess. We, which And you could do that either way. You could put the estimate in the estimate and put the, the, the detailed numbers in the narrative, or you could put the detailed numbers in, in the question and put the either, either way, whatever works better for you, I think. And, and, um, and that's really helpful. But And then the other sort of related question is on, on uh, questions like this, if we have, we've done the thing, so it is applicable, but we don't have the data, we just do the negative, do we do the negative one or do we? Yeah. Right, and um, yeah. So if you don't have any, if you don't have any idea of a number, um, okay. So this covers this basically for the this covers the whole report, but um, is, is relevant here. If um, numbers that you don't have data for, there's there's basically two kinds. There's um, or questions that you don't have data for. There is we didn't do that, or it's not relevant to us. In which case, those you want to put either a zero or an NA, depending on whether it's a um, numeric or text question. Um, and then there are questions which, uh, like you implied, where you don't, you did it, but you don't have a number. And that's a negative one. Um, oh, and I don't think there are NAs, it's a, it's a negative one. And so for co the COVID questions, it's the same situation. If you don't have, you don't have a number that you have any, that you, that you wanna use basically, or, or any estimate, you wanna put a negative one there. And that goes beginning to end of the report. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Perfect. Thank you for asking that. Um, okay. So I am going to, uh, let's see, hop, uh, oh, let me open the chat again. Um, okay. I'm going to hop to the next one. Okay. So then the, these are the last ones. These are the ones I referenced earlier, which are a bunch of yes, no, NA questions that IMLS is asking. And um, let me just, um, they are, I think they're not going to take you an enormous amount of time. They're a little bit like filling out the um, the status and uh, services survey that we're asking you, but but not quite. Um, so let me um, here. I'm just going to give you examples real quick. Um, but and, you, and they'll all be listed um, on the on the website. But it's basically things like. Um, were you closed for any period of time during the pandemic? Yes, no. Did library, uh, did staff provide services while the building was closed? Yes, no. Did you add or increase access to electronic collections due to the pandemic? Yes, no. Um, did you allow patrons to register for library cards online or by phone? Did you do reference services um, uh, while the building was closed? Uh, did you um, do curbside or some other non-standard way for circulating fiscal uh, items? Did you do live uh, virtual programming? Did you um, provide recordings on the internet? Did you allow people to use Wi-Fi outside the building? Um, did you increase your Wi-Fi access? Um, and uh, did staff, municipal staff go to work for other agencies or organizations? So those I think are, are not gonna take a tremendous amount of time. Um, they're basically just yes, no, or NA, and NA in this case means that COVID didn't really cover your period time period. So, um, okay, so that is basically the COVID changes. Um, I, uh, more generally for the report, uh, most everything else for the report will be the same. It's gonna be the same portal. It's gonna be the same usernames and passwords. Our, my intended uh, submission period is December 1st through the end of January um, with a two week uh, extension at the end of that time uh, by, by request. It's possible that our start time is gonna get pushed back because basically uh, there are only two vendors who handled the, these surveys basically, and every state is trying to get them to change them dramatically. And so they're, they're kind of behind. So I'm hopeful that we're gonna start December one. It's possible that we won't, whatever it is, it's still gonna be a two month window. So worst case, it'll be, um, you know, we'll, we'll shift it back two weeks or even a month, but you'll still have a two week, uh, two month window along with a two week extension at the end of it. Um, so let's see, um, things that things that are going to happen. Um, the website 
uh, the, our web page that has the annual report on it, we'll have the recording of this, the recording of the other session, the longer session which goes through the entire report. It will have my PowerPoint, which I only showed you part of uh, right now, but covers the whole report in, as a rough summary. It will have the, it has it currently has the list of all the questions that will be on it, and um, and then uh, when we can and then we'll we'll follow up on the other questions and see on uh, if we can what we can put together from where to find live views, recorded views, etc. on the popular products. And then if there's anything else that we could add, obviously just let us know and we'll do it. But um, additional, so questions about anything that I covered or anything else around the report. One of the most important takeaways, which I think we've sort of said. Um, oh, uh, sorry, Cindy asked a question a little while ago, and I didn't answer it at all. Sorry. Cindy's question was, will your library service survey be adapted for virtual versus recording? Maybe. Um, so the thing is, um, I, this is a little, maybe this is more information than you need. Um, the the difference between virtual and recorded is less of a big deal for me than it is for IMLS, I think, in a sense. Um, we I know that virtual, but well, let me think about that anyway, uh, Cindy. Let me write that down. Um, but like I said, I, I think um, IMLS cares more about whether something happened live than I do. Um, so that's yeah, oh exactly. So that's fine. I think for us, for the sur for the the weekly survey, we I, I'm thinking of it as both. I um, and I should, but I should at least clarify that. So let me make sure that. The, but uh, either is fine for for me. Uh, thank you, Almi, and thank you for everybody for coming here. Oh, sorry, no, I was I had a point. My point was. Um, the report is already kind of a stressful thing, and the current environment is an incredibly stressful place. So tr do your best not to stress about these, the new COVID questions on the on the um, report. Um, as much as you can, we're going to get the data we're going to get. And th this is partially why um, three three months ago, we, I, why, why I haven't been harping on it. I mean, partially it's been a moving target, but partially we've always felt like giving people services is more important than counting the services. And so our our push has been to try to get people to um, support people so they can give services. So don't stress, um, give us what you have. Don't like, don't dig super deep into the weeds if you can avoid it. We'll just, we're gonna get what we get and we, we will be thankful for whatever we get. Um, so, and it, it, if you have, if you think of a question 10 minutes from now or at any point, um, I'll, I'll, I'll reiterate a thing I also said in the other uh, on the other report session. If you're struggling with something on the report, please don't. Please get in touch with me, like this, immediately. Um, don't. I, if I, I occasionally have people be like, "Oh, I was working on this for like four days, and I don't." Don't. Please don't. Just contact me. Um, I, I, that's what I'm here for, and I don't want you having any extra stress on this re giant report thing that I ask you to do. Um, so. So never hesitate to get in touch. Um, and 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 I guess you know I guess I'll say the big thing these this, most of the changes a couple of the changes have been IMLS mandated. The other changes really are us just trying to capture a, a small a, a small slice of all the awesome stuff you guys have been doing. Uh, you folks have been doing during the um, during COVID. So. That's what it's there for. So don't it's 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 extra credit in a way. But um, but whatever numbers we get, we are going to be uh, super happy to have. So that's that's it. Thank you, everyone, uh, so much for taking a, an hour out of your day to do this. While I know things are swirling like crazy, um, and we appreciate it. And uh, you're awesome. So have so a great. Much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Have a great. Um, this is.
it's only Wednesday. That doesn't seem possible. <laughs> Have a great rest of your week. Um, thank you, Josh. Thank you. Happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Oh, good point. Happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Whatever, whatever that looks like. Uh, happy, happy holiday. And um, and if if I can ever help with anything, report or otherwise, just let me know. Have a great rest of your week. Thanks so much. And take care, y'all. Bye. Bye.